We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is head of research at goldmoney.com. Of course, it's Alistair McLeod. How are you today, Alistair? I'm fine. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, thank you for asking me. Thank you for joining us again. So you recently wrote about the U.S. Treasury's plan to flood the financial system with cash by reducing its balance on its general account at the Fed and not renewing an equivalent amount of T-bills. And separately, the Fed will continue with QE at a rate of $120 billion per month. And this doesn't include the stimulus package of $1.9 trillion. So this all seems like a very exorbitant amount of currency. So can you walk us through how all of this works and what the downstream consequences of this would be? I'll try to. <laughs> the, uh, the first thing to note is that um, what the Treasury plans to do is to spend the balance on its general account with the Fed. Now, this at the moment is around about $1.6 trillion. Um, the way in which they'll spend it is not by going out and buying things, but what they will do is they will not renew treasury bills as they become due. Now, what that means is that the people who currently have treasury bills who might expect to have rolled them over into the next series of treasury bills will not have that option and they will end up with cash. And so we are looking at a figure of around about, from memory, I think about $929 billion worth of money being released by the US Treasury by this means uh, in the current quarter. And uh, then there is an extra $300 billion uh, before um, the half year stage. So we're talking about very significant amounts of money. Um, but park that idea to one side. Uh, you then have um, uh, banks who basically don't have balance sheet space. And uh, by that, I mean that um, if they expand their balance sheet more than it is at the moment, they start running into penalties. And uh, this, this, I mean, there are, uh, some sort of space was created by the Fed last March uh, when they, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, it's the um, supplementary loan rate or something. Um, they suspended that so that the banks had room on their balance sheets to uh, absorb the consequences of QE, which they increased, you may recall, to 120 billion a month. Eight, uh, 90 of which was uh, US treasuries and the other 30 was, was agencies. Um, now, the reason this is important is because um, the, the effect on the banks is to increase their reserves. And the reason it increases their reserves is that the Fed only has accounts with commercial banks. Mm -hmm. The um, people who they're trying to get this QE to are basically insurance and pension funds. So they have to do that through the commercial banks. And the result is that the reserves increase as the, the money flows through um, uh, to the pension funds and the insurance companies. So um, you can see that there is a problem. Now, so what do the banks do? The problem that the banks have is at the same time, uh, the Fed's 120 billion a month of QE is continuing. So. Um, they've still got this problem, but the supplementary, um, um, whatever it was called, you know, that supplementary bit, which costs roughly, I think it was um, uh, 3% for an ordinary bank and an extra 2% for uh, a GSIB, um, that is due to come to an end at the end of March. And so far, the Fed has not turned around and said, we're going to extend it further so that you've got room on your balance sheets without being penalised. So it looks like um, that that's not going to be extended. It looks like the banks are going to have um, a problem of limited space on the balance sheets. And uh, therefore, they're going to start turning away big deposits. And the way they will do that, and we've just actually seen this in Germany with the German banks turning around and saying to large deposits, um, you know, sorry, we will recommend you go elsewhere because we're going to have to charge you to deposit money at this bank. And that effectively is the route, just about the only route um, that will be left for uh, the, the banks in America 
assuming that some sort of relief is not granted to them in terms of how much uh, balance sheet they can run relative to their capital. So it's a very, very clever idea if this is indeed what is intended. What we have is the US Treasury forcing the commercial banks to, in effect, uh, implement negative interest rates on their deposits, on some of their deposits, on new deposits. I mean, it's up to them to decide how to do it. Meanwhile, the Fed doesn't have to um, go into negative rates. It just remains uh, at the zero bound. Now, this is very, very important because the dollar is the currency in which all commodities are priced. And as soon as you um, put negative interest rates on the dollar, in fact, even zero interest rates on the dollar, in theory, what you're doing is you're creating a backwardation uh, in, in the whole commodity com complex. And it's, it's interesting to note that uh, the whole of the commodity complex basically turned on a dime um, in the second half of last March on the 20th, between the 20th and the 23rd, which are the two announcement dates, the first announcement being negative uh, zero interest rates, cutting interest rates by 1%, uh, and uh, the second one being, we're going to do whatever it takes, QE, 120 billion, if, you know, if necessary, more will be done, and we're doing this and we're doing that. There was that statement that was on the 23rd of March. So um, the Fed will be able to stay to to, if you like, not have to go into negative rates. Now, I can see that the Fed would not want to go into negative rates, but I can see that equally that the Fed would want to have negative rates in the market. So this, this would, would uh, uh, satisfy that requirement. And the other reason I think that this is likely to be the strategy is that um, the only other major central bank with positive interest rates, and by positive I mean at zero, <laughs> uh, is the Bank of England. And the Bank, Bank of England has given very, very clear um, indications that they want to introduce negative interest rates. Oh, if we did it here in, 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 in Britain, that would leave the Fed as the only major central bank with positive or zero to positive interest rates. And given that these guys meet every two months and chew the cud at the Bank of International Settlement in, a, in sort of, you know, a sort of Chatham House rules meeting where nobody <laughs> says anything outside, you can see that uh, this negative rate thing is something which is quite likely, I think more than likely, that both the Fed and the Bank of England would want to join in on. And uh, I mean, obviously, they wouldn't want to do it on their own. Um, but I think that this is the way it's going to be done. It looks like it. And that was the thrust, if you like, of, of my article and what I conceive to be the, the, you know, the reasoning behind uh, the, tre the, the Treasury increasing um, the amount of money in circulation by drawing down on its general account of the Fed. Mm. And basically forcing those, those negative interest rates to the banks, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. So, um, I, I'd like to go back to a term that you used there, backwardation. That's something that was brought up recently um, when I spoke with Ed Steer. Um, so can you define what backwardation, um, how that works and, and what it is, Alistair? Yeah, I mean, the normal way in which you regard a backwardation is that there's a shortage of a commodity for uh, near-term delivery compared with longer-term delivery. So that the price... Um, for delivery today or tomorrow is higher than the price, let us say, for delivery in a month's time. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we're looking actually at the money side of what happens. If you've got negative interest rates on overnight money, um, then obviously it costs you to have overnight money. So you don't want the money. So, but going out along the yield curve, it then gets positive. So your backwardation is coming from the other side of the, of the equation you know, money, commodity. So that is actually what happens. And um, this, I mean, basically, it, it would just drive commodities up and up and up and up over a period of time. And as I say, we've already seen what's happened to commodities uh, since March the 20th and 23rd last year. Mm -hmm. That's what we mean by backwardition. In this case, it comes from the money side. So Alistair, why are bonds moving up all, all over the world? We've recently seen that the US bond yields moved up, but adding that, um, Canada, Germany, Australia, and the UK. So what is this an indication of? Uh, 
Well, it's it, it's an interesting question. I think um, there are two possibilities, um, and I'll dismiss the, f- the first one first. The first one is that we're heading for economic recovery, and therefore mm-hmm. bonds are beginning to reflect, if you like, um, a future where things return to some sort of normality. Um, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, I mean, before we started this this broadcast, we were talking about um, the damage that's been done to underlying economies. Supply chains are all over the place. Um, I, something around about a third, at least a third, possibly more of major economies have basically been put out of action by COVID in this year. And the idea that suddenly it's all going to be all right again. And, you know, we all return to normal and banks will lend money again. And, you know, we'll go out and spend and we'll get to aircraft and fly and see other places. No, forget it. We're not going to have that recovery. So the question still remains, why are bond yields going up? And the answer basically is inflation. Uh, The markets are beginning to understand, and they've just watched commodity prices rise. They've watched cryptocurrencies rise. They've watched particularly silver rise. They have watched gold rise, but not by very much. And they've noticed the dollar weaken. Now, the effect of all this is um, the purchasing power of money next year would appear to be less than it is currently. Now, there is no point in you sitting on money if that is the case, unless you're compensated by a higher rate of interest. And it's that is the realization of this inflation, uh, developing inflation, you know, starting from the commodities, and then on lockdown. I mean, once lockdown goes, uh, you're going to have a lot of people. Um, I mean, it's it's a minority, but uh, a minority with a substantial amount of money unspent. They've already been spending it on second homes, or you know, trying to <laughs> driving up property prices elsewhere. Um, uh, what they're going to want to do is they're going to want to go out and, you know, party and, and buy things and all the rest of it. But the production isn't there. And it's not there because there is a substantial part of the work- workforce which is not producing the goods and services which are going to be demanded by these people afterwards. So what happens? Well, the price of everything just goes up and it goes up at a f- far faster rate than the 2%, the alleged 2% uh, that the Fed is working on. So um, I would say that the answer is not, uh, you know, a wonderful recovery um, and things returning to normal. And, uh, you know, interest rates may be moving up to two or three percent and tapering coming back. That is that that really is um, cloud cuckoo land. Uh, It's all about inflation and it's the loss of the purchasing power of the currencies. And the interesting thing is it's not just the dollar. You look, as you pointed out, you look at the rates in in the UK, um, in the Eurozone, Japan, all the rates are rising. Some of them are even getting close to positive territory. (laughs) I mean, the German Bund, I was looking at it, um, it sort of rallied from about minus 0.65 to around about 0.1, minus 0.1. So, you know, there's no doubt. I mean, and the other thing, as far as the currency is concerned, is that... um, If you just think it was the dollar, then, you know, it would be a situation where you think, well, uh, from the dollar end, it's closing up. So we'll go and buy euros and sell dollars. Um, Yeah. But as well as that, with rising yields in the eurozone, it just basically means that the advantage that you had holding dollars is just basically being removed. Excellent. So, Alistair, as as you're talking about, you know, holding or or these currencies losing their purchasing power over time. This is obviously, you know, ob- inflationary or even hyperinflationary. So can you walk us through what a hyperinflationary scenario looks like um, and maybe take the US dollar, for example? Yeah, well, it depends how you define it. Um, modern economists um, leave the definition of inflation uh, with prices. Uh, that is not the classical tradition at all. Uh, the classical economists and the Austrian school uh, quite clearly um, uh, define inflation as something that happens to the money. Um, inflation, if you increase the quantity of money in circulation, that is inflation. The prices are the result of inflation, if you like. And that is certainly the way I look at it. When it comes to hyperinflation, um, 
various people have various definitions. Now, nowadays, mostly they look at what happens to prices and they will say that Venezuela is in hyperinflation. What they should be looking at on my basis is they should be looking at what's actually happening to the money. Now, in the case of the United States, if you take the period from, again, I go back to that March when lockdowns started happening and uh, government finances just went completely haywire, uh, we had a situation where the, the, ma the majority of um, the government's revenue came from printing money, not from taxation. So the first condition I would say is that uh, you have to see, you, you, you would expect to see in, in, with hyperinflation, uh, the um, government finances being uh, predominantly um, paid for through inflation. That's the first thing. And then the second thing you need to look at is, is it possible that this is just a one-off or is it something that's going to lead to a continuing path of financing through inflation, depending on inflation? And in the case of the United States, particularly with the election of Joe Biden, I would say that that is also true. So on that basis, by my definition, the dollar is already in hyperinflation. This is not yet recognized anywhere, um, and particularly by the people who follow prices, and more importantly, people who believe the uh, BLS numbers that the CPI is only rising at 1.4% or whatever they say. I mean, that is complete rubbish. Um, Prices, I mean, every, every American I've spoken to confirms what John Williams of Shadow Stats has been saying, uh, and that is that uh, price inflation has been running at closer to 7 to 10% uh, since uh, the great financial crisis, not the sort of, you know, 2%, give or take a, a little bit, which the CPI reckons. So the numbers that you are getting are completely false, and I think that's a very, very important point for your viewers to understand. Alistair, the last time you and I spoke, you were you were telling us that the basically the EU banking system is imploding. Has anything, you know, in that situation changed, or is that is that situation still just as fragile? Uh, the situation is just as fragile, and to that we can probably add something else. Um, the eurozone banks have um, got an enormous amount of government debt on their balance sheets. Uh, and with um, rising bond yields, obviously, the capital value of that debt is going down. Now, some of these banks are very, very highly geared, and it wouldn't take very much of a rise in bond yields in the Eurozone, um, you know, into, into positive territory uh, to wipe out uh, banks. And I would, I would particularly say that the Italian and French banks are the ones which appear to me to, to be at most risk amongst the, the you know, the big countries. Obviously, you've got Greece, Portugal, uh, Spain isn't all that clever either. Um, but even in Germany, I, you know, the um, Commerzbank and uh, Deutsche Bank, their, their uh, balance sheets look pretty lousy. And if you look at the way the shares have performed, I mean, you know, they're bouncing along the bottom. I mean, Deutsche Bank has doubled like from about five euros to 10 euros. But you know, that compares, I can't remember what the old high was, 200, something like that. I mean, you know, it's it's literally, um, uh, you know, the whole thing is just, it's, it's just a zombie, a complete banking zombie. Now, with businesses going bust in the Eurozone because of COVID, I mean, it's exactly the same problem we all have. Uh, you know, you begin to ask yourself, how long can this situation of the banking zombies continue? And the answer is, um, can't be very long. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about all this devaluation of currencies and, and currencies being, let's say, printed into oblivion, you recently tweeted a chart um, that we'll, we'll put up on the video here, comparing basically how cheap the price of gold is compared to all the dollars in circulation and at the Fed. So tell us a little bit more about, about how cheap gold is relative to all of this money supply. Well, it's, it's I mean, it's, it's as cheap pretty well as it's ever been. Um, the most expensive times for gold relative to dollars uh, was when it was first fixed back in 1934 at $35 an ounce. And also when it peaked at $800, 850, I think it was in, was it 1980 or 1981? Um, and, uh, but ever since then, I mean, you know, it's just gone down and down and down. So um, priced relative to dollars, and we're talking about the quantity of dollars in issue, 
compared with gold in issue, it's as cheap as it's ever been. I, it's it's just absolutely extraordinary. I mean, it's something like a tenth of the price it was back in in uh, 1934. And it just shows how broken markets are, because here we have monetary inflation taking off. You can argue the toss about whether it's hyperinflation or not, but the one thing you must um, admit is that we have uh, unprecedented monetary inflation for peacetime. And on that basis, you would think that gold would front run the increase in the quantity of dollars, the quantity of euros, the quantity of pounds, and the quantity of yen, but no. It's just sitting down there on the bottom like a dead body at the bottom of your swimming pool. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a terrible, terrible thing to imagine. Terrible, though, right? terrible image, I know. <laughs> but that's what it looks like. So as as you see it, could could gold start to pick up when when yields start to drop or start to be controlled? Uh it's it, one of the big mistakes I think a lot of people make. In fact, the whole of the macroeconomic community makes is that they think that uh, rising bond yields is bad for gold. It isn't. I mean, I just, you know, without going into too much de detail, if you look at the 1970s, um, we came into the 1970s with um, interest rates, dollar interest rates, I think from memory, something like seven or eight percent, and the price of gold at $35. Um, we exited the 1970s with the price of gold having seen 800 plus and interest rates, you know, not seven, eight percent, but 19 and a half, 20 percent. I think prime rate was 20 and a half percent at one stage. So you had gold which multiplied many, many times, while at the same time, dollar interest rates trebled. So, you know, what really matters is not, um, uh, you know, bond yields going up. In the very short term, obviously, traders will look at it um, and uh, that will spark their interest one way or the other. But actually, what really matters is uh, what is the, um, what's happening to the purchasing power of the currency compared with the purchasing power of gold. People make the mistake also of saying, well, gold pays no interest. Now, that's actually not true. Uh, what they're looking at is physical bullion in your possession, but then you should be comparing it with $1,000 bills in your possession. They don't pay any interest either. But if you use your gold, if you deposit it, if you um, lend it to someone else, it gains an interest rate. And the interest rate is far lower uh, than you would have to or expect to pay in normal times on a fair currency, um, because it is a completely different thing. Um, so, all, you know, those are the relationships that really matter. And I think that this idea that we have rising bond yields and this is why gold has gone down, um, that could well be true, but equally it is completely wrong. And I would expect that at some stage there would be a reversal, if you like, in this situation, uh, when people actually realize what is actually happening to the purchasing power of dollars, euros, pounds, and so on and so forth, and understand that it's not happening to gold. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to silver, Alistair. What do you think the outcome of the bullion banks holding this big short position that they have is? And, you know, considering you're in London, do you know if there's any silver left in, in London to fulfill all of these deliveries that we've we've seen um, on, on the COMEX? You know, this, this delivery week was very important, right? Yeah. Um, I think one thing to correct, um, the bigger short position by far is in COMEX gold. Um, and the reason I mention this is that it is in the interests of the bullion banks to try and get the price down. Um, and what they basically want to do is they want to convince you not to hold gold so that they can buy your gold. I mean, that's, that's basically the, um, you know, what they're trying to do in the market. Um, now, having said that, the problem they have with silver is that um, it's a very illiquid market. And when there is very little silver around, it's very difficult to know where to get hold of silver. And they have been caught somewhat by, um, you know, this, if you like, sort of Wall Street, Robin Hood <laughs> thing of trying to, trying to persuade people to have a go at the bullion banks. Um, it did actually create something of a run on, uh, you know, physical coins, small bars, things like that. Um, and all the information I have is that um, there is virtually none available in the London vaults. 
um, I won't say none, but virtually none. Mm -hmm. Same is true in Switzerland. Um, I've been talking to friends in Australia and they tell me the same thing. I mean, the interesting thing in Australia is that the Perth Mint refuses to sell you any silver, but claims that they've got 40 or 50 tons, which they can ship over to New York to relieve the problem on COMEX at the drop of a hat. I mean, <laughs> could be, it could be that the system, as it were, is hoarding whatever liquidity it can in the current situation. So I wouldn't rule that out. Um, but basically, uh, you know, the silver stocks are, uh, are more or less cleaned out. And um, I notice also that, you know, there's some deliveries going through. I think something like 30 million ounces or something um, delivered in this last week uh, from, you know, standing to deliver for delivery on COMEX. So, um, you know, in a tight market, this is creating quite a bit of difficulty. And I think it's only a matter of time, really, before... Um, this uh, uh, bear raid by the um, by the bullion banks trying to uh, get their position straight before the next rise in the gold price and the silver price. I mean, I think it won't last very long. I mean, to me, it's just a wonderful opportunity. I mean, I'm saying, you know, uh, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to continue to stack. Um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people, you know, who um, perhaps haven't really sort of grasped uh, the importance of having physical gold and silver as money in the current environment as an insurance against um, uh, a collapse of fiat currencies. They haven't necessarily quite got that message on board. And they're, th they're looking at it as if this is an investment. And they see um, their investment going down. Now, normally, if you're a portfolio manager, you're managing your own money, you see an investment go down, you think, I better ditch it because it's taking me nowhere, um, which is fair enough. And that's usually the right, the right thing to do mm -hmm. if it was an investment. But we're talking about money, which is a very, very different thing. So, I mean, the point is, the point is that in the fullness of time, the physical gold and the physical silver, which you possess, you will spend and you'll spend it when nobody else has got it. <laughs> and you can buy a lot of things when nobody else has got gold or silver. I, the, the amount of physical gold and silver held um, in, in Western markets is, is pitiful. I mean, it really is. They've got a lot of paper stuff, but I mean, that'll go, that goes with, um, uh, with fiat currency. I mean, that'll disappear. So you'd just be left with um, you know, a few guys who've got some physical and um, you know, they will be kings of it all they survey. It's, it's right. more, more right, of a, I believe I am <laughs> more of a store of value than a than an investment, right? Well, it's more than that. It is throughout history. It has been money, and um, it continues to be money. And um, it's what is it is the risk free asset that central banks have on their balance sheets. They don't have Bitcoin; they have gold, mm -hmm. and they have it there for a reason. So, Alistair, did this last week play out um, as you expected it would? Or, or was there anything that surprised you about it? Well, it was certainly a possibility. I mean, we, I've, I've been watching the, um, uh, the moves of the um, uh, bullion banks. And, um, you know, I've been tracking this for some time. And they've managed to reduce their uh, um, uh, exposure uh, from something like um, short $48 billion worth of gold on COMEX alone, I mean, I'm not talking about what's going on in London, that's a slightly separate issue. Um, but that's a hell of a lot when you think that uh, on, on uh, COMEX, there's something like uh, 28, 29 um, in the swaps category, which are basically the bullion bank trading desks. I mean, to have that much spread amongst them, I mean, this is well over a billion each. They've now got that down on the last figures to, I think it's around about 31, Billion, 32 billion, something like that net. Um, and doubtless, the figures that we will get uh, on Friday, the, the commitment of trades figures on Friday will show that they've managed to, to get it even lower. So um, I don't, you know, I don't wish any trader any harm, but um, the sooner that they can sort out their own books and we can get on with a proper market, as far as I'm concerned, I think it would be better for everybody. Mm -hmm. So have they been able to prolong this game by leasing gold and silver to different entities or, or having multiple claims to the metals? 
I think what's been happening is not them leasing gold to different entities. What's happened is that the central banks have leased gold into the market. And we saw evidence of this uh, last August when the price ran up to uh, what 2075, I think it was more or less the top on August the 8th, um, because it was recorded in the GLD prospectus that some 40 tons was um, being stored in the Bank of England. Now, the only way that could have got there is that uh, the Bank of England leased it to an authorized participant who then delivered it um, in inverted commas to uh, GLD, the, the GLD custodian. Now, um, what tends to happen in these circumstances is the gold doesn't move from the Bank of England vault. It just moves from uh, the lessor, you know, XYZ central bank to the lessee, whether it's JP Morgan or someone like that, who also has an account with the Bank of England uh, and, and can store gold, uh, gold there. It only happens with gold, by the way, which means it is a rather different market from silver. Mm -hmm. you, you know, there isn't silver to be leased into the market, so it doesn't really happen there. But um, you could quite clearly, um, uh, it, and for a long time, um, ever since 1971, when the gold price um, sort of, you know, the Bretton Woods thing ended, um, uh, really ever since then, central banks have um, increasingly being leasing gold into the markets. And um, there's a chap called Frank Veneroso, who's a very good analyst, uh, and he looked at this and he concluded that in around about 2000 and 2002, uh, that somewhere between 10 and 15,000 tons of central bank gold was being leased into the market. So, you know, they can intervene in, in very, very substantially to, let's say, smooth things over. But the problem is that if the price of gold continues to rise, and let us say um, a bullion bank defaults, the problem is that if you're in GLD and um, you know there's say 40 tons of that uh, has been leased from the bank, ownership has not changed. You've got two owners in effect. You know you've got you've got uh, GLD and you've got a central bank, and in this case the lessor still has uh, ownership. He may not have possession, but he has ownership. So it could be reclaimed. And that's something worth thinking about. So we can, I, I would imagine there is quite a substantial amount of gold, physical gold in the markets, which has got more than one owner. So is this why you say that, that silver could be a canary in the gold, gold mine and that, that the gold market is, is far more important than the silver market? Uh, yes, um, because the central banks don't have silver. The Bank of England doesn't store any silver whatsoever. So the commercial um, banks and their bullion trading desks have to basically uh, source their own silver. And most of the silver that's held in London is either in the form of um, uh, ETFs like SLV. I mean, the, the, there are lots of other ETFs as well, which store in London. Uh, and um, on top of that, you've got industrial users who um, you know, will buy silver um, and uh, not take it out of, uh, you know, vault storage simply because um, they don't want it hanging around their property. They will basically take it out as and when they need to use it. So um, there's not a lot of liquidity around between those two major categories. I mean, the rest of it is, is um, you know, a very, very small slice, and it doesn't take very much to drive the price significantly higher. And if you want to buy it, silver in London and gold for that matter, in any size, you're being quoted delivery dates way out, you know, sort of April, May, um, which, which um, uh, is in a sense, it's not unusual, but it's more acute, if you like, now than it has been in the past. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about indicators like this or, or canaries, can you explain to us your views on Bitcoin, its, it's non-expanding supply and why it could die along with fiat currencies? Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is, is, you know, is obviously a fascinating development. And um, the thing which catches my eye about it is that it's educated um, a whole sort of millennial generation or generations in the plural um, about what's happening to fiat currency. Because, I mean, the reason you buy Bitcoin is you understand that the rate of its issuance is fixed 
and it only goes to 21 million Bitcoin, and it does it very slowly and very expensively in terms of energy, whereas governments can print like mad. And so what would you rather have? And of course, you can extend that into forecasting what the price of Bitcoin is, is going to do. And of course, you know, and this is, everybody's getting in on this game, you know, um, $100,000, $130,000, half a billion, you know, 20 million. I mean, you know, <laughs> you can say what you want. Ultimately, Bitcoin, uh, you know, if things don't change, Bitcoin will get there. And you can't argue against that. Um, it is a very separate argument as to whether Bitcoin should be regarded as money rather than just purely a store of value. And the answer to that is, is no um, on two basic broad counts. The first is, imagine if Bitcoin was money. Imagine further that uh, you were trying to manufacture something and you needed to borrow Bitcoin in order to... Um, do this manufacturing. And uh, you would reckon that uh, out of the sales of the widgets that you're going to make, um, that you'd probably pay back those Bitcoin in 10 years time. I mean, completely. But what is going to be your assumption about the purchasing power of Bitcoin in 10 years time? Oops, that is a problem because there's no way I can borrow Bitcoin to invest in production in order to produce things if the price of those things in Bitcoin is going to fall through the floor, not because they're going down, but the money is going up. It is the most deflationary situation you could possibly imagine. That is why Bitcoin cannot work. I mean, just imagine, would you have a bond market with, with, with Bitcoin? What would be the interest rates on, uh, let's say, corporate debt? <laughs> I mean, it would probably have to be a huge minus figure. You know, this is, I mean, it is, it is actually just complete nonsense. Uh, it cannot work as money. The second consideration, which I think is um, probably more important, because people can always make silly decisions, but the, the more important uh, point I would like to make is that central banks don't own Bitcoin. They do own gold. They need to uh, remember what gold was about. That's not too difficult a process. I mean, when fiat currency collapses, you'll remember what gold was about very, very quickly, particularly since you've got some in the basement. Um, and therefore, it will be gold that will be monetized, not Bitcoin. Central banks do not have Bitcoin. And furthermore, they don't want to have a situation where um, they lose all control over money by um, just abandoning it and saying, all right, we're just going to close down, we're just going to close down, go away, and you can sort yourself out. I can't see any central banker taking that view. Mm -hmm. So, Alistair, if, if we think about, let's say, a central bank backing um, a new version of a currency by gold, doesn't that have some of the same issues because it's not necessarily... Um, they can't expand that supply of gold at the same rate as the economy needs to grow? Well, um, the, there are, again, two aspects on, on this. I mean, if we look at just from the gold end, um, the amount of monetary gold around at the moment is uh, a fraction of total above ground stocks. Total above ground stocks, uh, I mean, we reckon it's around about 190,000 tonnes. Of that, central banks have got 34,000 tons. People like you and me with um, you know, the odd gold coin and so on and so forth have got a bit more. But um, so we've got perhaps, let's say top tops, we've probably got something like 70 to 100,000 tons of monetary gold. Um, the rest of it is basically in jewelry or not in circulation or in wherever it might be. Um, but the point about it is that if the markets demand more gold, then the purchasing power of gold will go up because it is in short supply, and that will attract gold from other uses to become monetary gold. So there is a flexibility in there, which means that gold acts well as money. And it's worth noting that this is something which is not available with cryptocurrencies at all, if anything, the reverse. Excellent. So, Alistair, uh, you know, a couple of questions that I've been getting recently are how, how does one go about thinking about <clears throat> using fiat currency right now? Let's say you have investments in, in gold and silver miners. 
and you you see that the the currency is is inflating away any purchasing power it has. So how do you think about basically using fiat currency and maybe using it as a as a hot potato of of trying to get out of it and, and switch it for real assets? Well, you can take um, you can take a number of approaches, I suppose. I mean, the, the simplest one, um, which is available, I think, to anyone with a little bit of money to protect, is just to buy physical gold and maybe some physical silver. Um, the other thing you can do, I mean, this is, I'll, I'll cite a, um, an interesting case. I mean, back in the German in, uh, hyperinflation in uh, the early 1920s, uh, there was a chap who was known as the Inflation King, and his name, I'm trying to remember it. Um, anyway, basically what he did was he um, uh, had businesses. He had businesses which earned foreign exchange because they were exporters. Um, he therefore had some real money, because remember in those days, the dollar was backed by gold. So it was the same thing as gold. I mean, you could exchange it for gold without any difficulty whatsoever. Um, and uh, it's a chap called Hugo Stinnis. The name has come back. Anyway, Stinnis was the inflation king. And what he did was he used this base of um, businesses and earnings in foreign currency to borrow in depreciating marks. At one stage, he earned almost a quarter of all German industry by the end of 1923. Uh, unfortunately, Hugo Stinnis died... Um, <laughs> Uh, he, he died uh, as a result of a, 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 of a medical operation um, in 1924. So he didn't, he didn't uh, really live long enough to, to enjoy all his fabulous wealth. Um, but that's one way you can do it. The other, way, the other thing to bear in mind is that as the purchasing power of paper currencies goes down, um, the purchasing power of gold in its own right goes up. So if you've got physical gold, that is at the top of the pile, if you like, in terms of value. Things like um, uh, shares in gold mines are probably next down there. Somewhere down further down the pile, uh, you've got um, property, residential property, for example, buildings, that sort of thing, physical assets. Uh, you have shares and stocks. Now, it's important with equities that you only end up owning equities which survive despite the collapse of the paper currencies. And the one thing you must not have is any fixed rate bonds. So you can see the immediately the problem that this gives governments in this environment because um, uh, you know the, their cost of funding is just going to go through the roof. But to give you an idea as to how powerful the purchasing power of gold is under these circumstances, in 1923, um, sort of mid-1923, so you know, some months before the final collapse of the currency, you could have bought a six-bedroom house in a, uh, you know, as, if you'd like, a fashionable uh, residential area of Berlin for $100. Now, $100 was just under five ounces of gold at the time. That is the difference, if you like, between the top asset uh, in terms of what you can do with it. And more or less, apart from mine, you know, mines and so on and so forth, the next top asset, which is residential property. And I mean, residential property got killed because uh, the yields on them just disappeared completely. So um, as far as I'm concerned, I think the way to play the inflation game for most people would be to have some gold and some silver. And remember that in the complete collapse that it's not just you that you've got to be considering, it's your family, your friends, those in your community, because there has to be some sort of social cohesion and that is going to only come through the cooperation of people with something to cooperate with. And I think that's a very important point to remember, unless you're one of these guys who just heads for the hills and sort of <laughs> locks himself away until, some stage in the future, um, it's all over. But, uh, you know, that's, that's, I don't think being socially responsible, it's being personally responsible, perhaps. Um, but I don't think that's an opportunity which many of us, certainly in this country, have. Hmm. America is a bit different. <laughs> well, on that, on that, uh, 
you know, dis- disappointing note, Alistair, is there anything uh, that you're thinking about this week um, that's that's kind of capturing your your attention or your imagination? Well, it's uh, uh, sort of a bit of a contrary, really, Tom, because um, I've been writing about this damned inflation thing so many times. I mean, you know, I can only beat people's head against the brick wall so much before my arms get tired. <laughs> so I'm uh, this week, I mean, tomorrow's article will look at the ridiculousness of um, uh, following statistics. And I start with a quotation, which was one of uh, Lord Canning. And Lord Canning was very briefly prime minister in 1820. And even in those days before computers and all the rest of it, he said, I can prove anything with statistics except the truth. And I think that's something that we ought to all bear in mind every time we look at the garbage that comes out of government statistical departments. That's a that's an excellent point, Alistair. Uh, of course, we can find more of your writing at goldmoney.com. And also um, your your Twitter handle is at McLeod Finance, where you, you post a lot of that stuff as well on uh, King World News. Is there anywhere else you'd like our listeners to find you? Well, uh, th- I think that more or less covers it. Uh, um, I'm not really all that good at all this sort of social, you know, doing all these sort of Facebooks and Twitter, I can just about manage. Um, but I publish a, an article on Thursdays on the Gold Money website. So if you go to Gold Money and hit the research tab, then insights, and that the insight article comes out on the Thursday. And I also do a market report on precious metals on the Friday. So tomorrow and the day after, and they're released more or less sort of midday to early afternoon EST. Excellent. Thanks very much for your time today, Alistair. It's my pleasure, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.